The note was about George getting a massage from a man. At that point in my life, I had never, I, Jason, had never had a massage from a man because it, 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 I just went, oh, I'm not gonna, you know, if I'm gonna be felt up, I'd rather be by a woman, no matter how much less talented they are. I don't, and please, please make it a very unattractive woman because I'm not interested in anything but. George. <laughs> Yes? I'm Raymond. <laughs> Hello? I remember the moment very clearly where I get onto the table and, and uh, the guy gave a yank to my belt and you, you just see me go, you know, <laughs> like it's beginning. <laughs> the sodomy is beginning. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> <laughs> and there was this one one scene where he comes back and tells Jerry about the massage and he's uh, he's very concerned that it moved. I think it moved. <laughs> moved? It may have moved, I don't know. I'm sure it didn't move. It moved. It was imperceptible, but I, I felt it. Maybe he just wanted to change positions, you know. <laughs> shift to the other no, side. No, no. It wasn't a shift. I've shifted. This was a move. It was the epitome of, of that great neurosis, that great neurosis that Larry captures better than anybody, of what could this mean? What could any little, the most insignificant thing mean? I don't think that came out of my life. Um, certainly, I, I probably had that, that fear that uh, a man touching me could actually make it move. So, um, and if it did, w w would that in, in fact make me gay? Um, so we gave that to George. And to blow it out of proportion and harp on it and make decisions based on it was just, <laughs> and everybody does it. Everybody does it, but nobody, nobody would, but Larry would realize that, that it is A, universal, and B, really funny. Okay, so what if it moved? That's the sign, the test, if a, if a man makes it move. That's not the test. Contact is the test. If it moves as a result of contact. I think it's contact. <laughs> it has to be touched. That's what a gym teacher once told me. The main thing was we had to get it on the air. We didn't really refer to it as a penis. We, we called it it, and I couldn't imagine how the censors would even have a problem with it. The penis, shall we say, on our show is referred to as it a lot. We sort of worked the censors the way a, uh, a, a, the way a coach works the referee, in, in that we'd make a big stink about stuff to, to get them to give in on, on other things that we really wanted. It was it in the note. It was also it when he took it out, whichever episode that was, in which he took it out. And I'm having these erotic conversations with censors on, on the telephone. I'm, I'm going, I, I want, I need the five breasts. And, well, I can't give you five breasts. I can only give you, you three breasts. You know, well, how, what about the penises? Well, I could give you one penis, you know. And so, we're, you know, and, and I'm beginning to have, like, sexual fantasies now about the censor, who I'm conversing with every week about this kind of material. It, it was it. The beginning of season three, Jerry called me on the phone. Said, what can we do to just give a little sparkle to the music, something a little different? He had heard some scat music, some group scat music and he described it to me and I said well we could try that there were some little horn riffs ba -da 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 -da, embodied within the music and I thought what if I put nonsense lyrics to those make sure that you tell him that you know you know me why what's the difference he's a doctor what is he? oh you know Bob oh, okay I'll give you the real medicine <laughs> Yeah, everybody else, I'm giving Tic Tacs. We tried it. Jerry liked it. Larry liked it. We finished the episode. We did the next couple of episodes using that music. Then the first episode aired. We forgot to ask anybody else. And when other people, Network, Castle Rock, heard this on the air and were surprised by it, it was not a favorable reaction, and we went back and fixed the next two episodes, so there's only one episode that actually has that music element in it that slipped through because we forgot to ask permission.
one of the things that's so interesting about the, the origins of Seinfeld is the interests that we all brought to the show that sort of influenced the style and tone of the show. One of those things was the Abbott and Costello show another, and Superman, and another one was actually Dragnet. And, and I was a big fan of Dragnet, and I loved Jack Webb's monologues, and I wanted to find a way to sort of like have a cop be able to do that kind of a monologue in a sitcom format. Took this book out in 1971. Yes, and I returned it in 1971. Yeah, 71, that was my first year on the job. Bad year for libraries. Bad year for America. <laughs> Hippies burning library cards. Abby Huffman telling everybody to steal books. I don't judge a man by the length of his hair, or the kind of music he listens to. Rock was never my bag. But you put on a pair of shoes when you walk into the New York Public Library, fella. Look, Mr. Bookman. <laughs> The library cop began with the idea of a, a book that's long overdue and a library cop coming out, you know, a, an obsessed cop looking for that book, you know. And then we had the good fortune of having Philip Baker Hall play the role and he delivered that monologue. I mean, it's like one of my favorite moments that I've ever worked on was hearing him say those words. I remember when the librarian was a much older woman, <laughs> kindly, discreet, unattractive. We didn't know anything about her private life. We didn't want to know anything about her private life. She didn't have a private life. So you're thinking about that, think about this. The library closes at five o'clock, no exceptions. This is your final warning. Got that, QB down? The pen was really fun because it gave us a chance to talk about these crazy uh, communities that our parents both lived in down in Florida with those insane, you know, names of vistas and, and you know, aquas and uh, del bocas and all of that stuff. There's a, a certain pettiness that goes on there that uh, just had to be, had to be broadcast. And of course, George Shapiro's pen. We were in the office, you know, uh, writing session or something and, uh, and uh, Larry didn't have a pen. I said, here's a pen, this is an astronaut pen. And he, I say, wow, it's beautiful. I said, you can write upside down. I said, really? I said, well, here, take the pen. And uh, I said, no, no, I can't take it. Take the pen, I'll get another pen. And uh, Larry didn't want to take it, and then he forced him to take it. And that was where, where that came from. And to this day, and I didn't know you were going to ask this question, I still have it. <laughs> it writes upside down. They use this in space. Oh, wow, that's the astronaut pen. Yeah. I heard about that. Where yeah. did you get it? Oh, it was a gift. Because oh, a lot of times I write in bed, and I have to turn and lean on my elbow to make the pen work. Take the pen. Oh, no. Go ahead. I couldn't. Come on, take the pen. I can't take Do it. Do me a personal no, favor. No, I'm not take the pen. I cannot take it. Take the pen. Are you Go sure? Ahead. I'm positive. Take the pen. It was very tough to get uh, Sandy Barron in the room. He was very mercurial. He uh, wasn't exactly easy to reach and it was only because all the planets were aligned properly that he happened to be at home when his agents called him and he happened to and he managed to get him down to the uh, himself down to the casting session listen do you think i take everything everybody offers me you offered me sponge cake yesterday then i take it you said you didn't want it of course i wanted it i love sponge cake he was funny in that show I mean, he played that part so well. Take the pen. <laughs> Take the pen. Take the pen. <laughs> I was delighted to be having, you know, material like the pen, which was a huge show for me and the most thrilling. Stella! <laughs> Stella! <laughs> Her back hurts. The great thing about all of that stuff <clears throat> like in the pen, was that it wasn't gender oriented at all. Even though there was a lot of, of course, conversations about gender in the show, but that, I mean, who would have thought to give that to a girl to, to, to get high on muscle relaxants and then scream Stella and, and then Jerry with his eyes like this? My God, that show was funny. That show was funny. Both Jason Alexander and Michael Richards were not in that episode. The pen was the first time that the ego of Jason is related to Seinfeld reared its little head. And it wasn't a major thing, but it, um, 
It had already happened to Michael. Michael had sat out for an episode, and here he was sitting out another one. Yeah, actually, I kept felt kind of bad about the fact that uh, Jason and, and Michael were not in that episode. I felt sort of guilty. I went to Larry when we came back to do the following episode, and I said, i got to talk to you about what happened last week. Um, you wrote me out of the show. <laughs> I said, I only, I only want to be here if I'm indispensable. I, I hadn't counted on a on this career. I, I mean, I just, I, it was not necessarily my fantasy. I, I, I grew up in my bathroom accepting the Tony, not the Emmy or the Oscar. I remember Jason told me, I wonder, this is true, I wonder if he'll tell you this, but he told me that he had gone up to Jerry and said, don't do that again. And I'm, I'm sure he did do that. And I went to Larry and I said, um, if you do it again, do it permanently. If you don't need me to be here, for every damn episode of Seinfeld that you write, then I don't need to be here. And he went, oh, come on. And I went, Larry, I, I know it doesn't make sense. I, I get that. But that's my feeling. I don't want to ever look at another episode of Seinfeld that, that George, I don't care what the participation, and I don't care if it's a line, I know you won't let it be anything that's, you know, garbage. But I've got to feel that you can't do this without my character and my work being a part of it, because if I do, I just don't want to be part of it. And, and he never did again. I don't know if it's because of that conversation. The Pen is my favorite um, Seinfeld episode. Um, I have parents who lived in those communities in Florida, and when I saw what Jerry and Larry, who also, of course, had parents living in those communities, had captured about that world down there, and to devote a whole half hour uh, to that world, uh, I just loved it. They, I just, I recognized each and every one of those types that they, they caught, and it, it just, it just reminded me of my late parents, and and uh, it speaks to me every time I see the episode. To this day, I haven't, uh, I, I still can't get enough accolades from the people who live down there talking about that show. Oh, that pen episode! Every time I'm down, the pen, the pen. Oh, so funny, you know. There is no reason my folks should have actually enjoyed the show we began with, but. It got right into their bones, and and you know, despite everything I said about the pen, it was the beginning of that was the first episode they really sat up and took notice because it was in their community. They live in Boca, you know, <laughs> and then, you know suddenly here was a thing about condo life in Boca, and they were getting it right. What was my favorite episode? Um, the pen. At least that's the one that comes to mind when anybody ever asks me that, and people do all the time. Um, I thought the circumstances were hilarious, and I got a chance to, you know, do a little, and um, yeah, the pen. <laughs>